Will you stand for the reading of God's Word? Turn with us to the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 12. As today we conclude this prophetic sermon series titled, The Four Kings, The Final Game of Thrones. Bible prophecy clearly reveals that immediately prior to the rapture of the church, four powerful kings would race upon the stage of world history with two objectives. Those objectives would first be to conquer the world, to sit on a throne, to rule as a global dictator, to be worshipped. The second objective is to conquer Israel and to destroy the Jewish people. Israel is now surrounded by nations screaming for their blood. Anti-Semitism is raging in Europe. Anti-Semitism is raging in America. I read the other day the story of a college professor who was pro-Israel, who was literally run off the campus by anti-Israel forces in the United States of America. The stage is set for the drama of the ages. These four kings are right now on center stage for the first time in world history. You are watching this massive prophetic, geopolitical drama on the front pages of your newspaper and on your smart televisions, uh, flat screens in your house. The final game of thrones has begun. The Gog-Magog war of Ezekiel 38-39 has begun. One of the brightest Jewish scholars in world history, Rabbi Radok, writes, and I quote, When the sun turns to darkness, that's an eclipse, and the moon turns to blood, that would be the four blood moons of Joel 2. This will begin the Gog-Magog War. The Gog-Magog War is the beginning of a series of wars that lead to World War III. We are racing toward the end of the world as we know it. Today, the king the kings of the east. Read with me Revelation 16, 12 and following. Ready? Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Father, Thank you for the word of God that reveals clearly the future. We rest with peace and confidence knowing that the God that we serve is the God who knows the end from the beginning and he is the Prince of Peace. Even so come Lord Jesus and all of God's children said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Who are the kings of the east? They are certainly distinguished from the king of the West by their numbers, by their colors, the colors of their flags, and by the three frogs, the three demonic spirits that seduce them and get them to come to the great day of God Almighty, the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is the mother of all wars. It will be fought on the sacred soil of Israel for global supremacy between the king of the west and the kings, plural, of the east. The prize, the throne of the earth to rule and reign. The Bible word for east simply means sun rising. Kings, plural, sun rising would be China, Japan, North Korea. 
The road to the Bible of Armageddon, the dry riverbed of the great river Euphrates. Revelation 9 adds to the confirmation of the king of the east. 9.16 says there's an army of 200 million men that will march up that dry riverbed. How do you move 200 million men? You march. If you've been in the Marine Corps, you know the way from point A to point B is to march. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. That's how this is going to happen. Now the number of the horsemen was an army of 200 million. John writes, and I heard the number of them. Only China can produce those kinds of numbers. Remember that China has just recently concluded a one child only program where they only allowed one child to be in the home. The girls were allowed to die by the tens of thousands because the sons were preferred. China has an enormous amount of men because of that foolish policy, but it evolved into the meaning of this text. Revelation 9, 17 gives us their colors. And thus I saw the horses. Understand John never saw a tank in his life. So he's referring to things that he knows about from his mindset. I saw horses in the vision and those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, blue and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone, Revelation 9, 17. Note the three dominant colors here are red, blue, and yellow. The horses, the machines of war, very probably tanks. Out of their mouths came fire and smoke. When they shot the cannon, that's what he saw. Have breastplates of fiery red and yellow. China's flag is red and yellow. China's army wears a dark blue uniform. China is called the yellow peril. Fire-breathing dragons are China's favorite symbol. It's amazing how accurate Bible prophecy is written so long ago about this nation. Consider the power of China. China is rapidly building warships superior in size and firepower to America. Their latest fighter jets are the equal of the U.S. Air Force. Some say China stole those plans from America, and they very likely did. China is upgrading their weapons of war. Her communication systems are state-of-the-art. China is threatening her neighbors, saying that if we get into a conflict with America, do not help America. China is building islands out into the international waters so that they can launch rockets and have a military input to Europe. The message that China is sending the West is this. We do not fear you and we do not respect you. China is hacking America's intelligent agencies. Hello, Washington. If you want a copy of Hillary Clinton's emails, China has a copy. Consider the possessions of China. China is buying up America's choice, high dollar real estate and major American companies. All of these statements are taken from sophisticated economics publications. The Business Insider publication says, and I quote, China is buying up American companies fast and it's freaking people out, end of quote. Chinese companies have been buying up America's businesses at a record rate and suddenly our leaders are alarmed. They let it happen. They're watching it happen. Why don't you stop it from happening? So we continue. Reuters News reports, March 18 of this year, China is trying to buy the Starwood Hotels in America for $13 billion. Another story, China is poised to demand that U.S. land be sold to them for America's debt. Get that in your mind. We owe them $2 trillion, and they're looking for $2 trillion 
of America's soil. They're trying to buy this nation out from under our feet. What can you do about it? Send somebody to Washington that will defend the people of the United States and these United States we live in. Consider the possessions of China. China is buying up America's choice, high dollar real estate and major companies. The, China, the, the Business Insider publication says, and I quote, China is buying, buying up uh, all of these companies in, in America and they are now bowering up America's farmland. You ever read that Bible verse that says the borrower is slave to the lender? Of this many acquisitions, the most sensational is the Chinese-led investor group's effort to buy the Chicago Stock Exchange. Listen, quote, this proposed acquisition should be the first time a Chinese-owned state-influenced firm maintains direct access to the $22 trillion U.S. equity marketplace, end of quote. That's the Business Insider, February the 21st of this year. The point is China is trying to control America's economy from China. Think about that. China is buying up huge amounts of America's farmland. 30 years ago, I asked my wife, Diana, what if foreign countries started buying America's farmland? And in a global food crisis, they would harvest those crops here and then ship them to China. Now that sounded far-fetched 30 years ago. She said, you should write a novel about that. <laughs> I said, it's just a fact, I'm just thinking. So I did some serious research and look at this chart put it on the Trinitron. The states that are colored in orange have sold 2% or more of their farmlands to foreign investors. 2% or more. You can't find out how much more because large land purchases are being made by shadow corporations where their true identity is difficult to find out. But the following states have sold 2% or more of their farmland to China. They are Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, Maine, and Michigan. Think about that. The Los Angeles Times of March 10, 14 says, quote, China looks abroad for greener pastures. And the story reads, China is buying hundreds of thousands of acres in America. Listen to the Chinese buyer who says, we want to bring American sunshine, America's land, and America's water back to China. And that's what they're doing. The Los Angeles Times continues, quote, China's largest pork producer paid $4.7 billion for Smithfield Foods and acquired more than 100,000 acres of farmland in one transaction, end of quote. Hello, America. Just where do you think this food is going to go in a time of a global food shortage? Not America. In most countries, it's against the law to sell farmland to a foreign source. Do not blame China. Blame America's foolish leaders who are willfully allowing this nation to be destroyed by foreign power. You can do something about that. Now let's go to the theology of the text. The three unclean frogs, Revelation 16 through 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that would be Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that would be the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. John tells us that these three evil spirits will cover the earth during the tribulation period. These are the unholy trinity. Frogs are connected to the occult. The second plague of Egypt was a plague against frogs because the Egyptians worshipped a frog-headed goddess. 
St. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 4 and 1 that in the latter times, that is right now, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Paul is saying in the latter times, there is going to be a revival of the occult. You can see the revival of the occult sweeping America in the books, in the movies, in the concepts that are being turned loose in our schools. What is the doctrine of demons? A doctrine of demons is teaching a way to God without Jesus Christ. The demonic doctrine, this demonic doctrine plagues America. It goes like this. We're all on different roads going to the same heaven. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the door, and no one gets in unless they knock on that door. I know the educational community is big into pluralism, but let me shoot that down in one simple verse. There is one God. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no other. The Bible says, Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He's not one of many. He is one and the only one. Give the Lord of heaven praise. Give him glory. Give him honor. Because there is no other God but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The revelation is saying demons are real. Demons deceive. Demons destroy. When anyone tells you there's another way to heaven without Jesus, you are listening to the prince of darkness preaching the doctrines of demons. Don't allow your children to get involved with occultic movies or occultic books or anything of that nature because it's a spirit and once that spirit gets in them, it will control them and destroy them. Why God will allow the battle of Armageddon? Why is God going to allow this horrific thing to happen? I give it to you in one sentence. To punish the nations for what they've done to Israel. Bible proof, Obadiah 115, quote, For the day of the Lord, that's a judgment day, upon all nations. How many nations? All nations, America included, is near. As you have done it unto Israel, it will be done to you. Think about that, America. Our nation has given Iran, the sworn enemy of Israel, the nation that shouts death to Israel, we have given to Iran $150 billion to build more sophisticated rockets and nuclear weapons to destroy Israel, bought and paid for with American money. Who is God Almighty going to allow to judge this nation for our betrayal of Israel? And don't you ever can think it was anything but betrayal. We as a nation have betrayed Israel in this administration. Will God allow terrorists who are here to sweep this nation? Will he allow some rogue regime like North Korea to launch one of those missiles and hit New York like they're talking about? They say, oh, it'll never happen. Pearl Harbor wasn't going to happen, but it did. Stopping prayer in school wasn't going to happen, but it did. We were never going to allow abortions in this nation, but it happened. We were never going to desecrate the marriage vow by allowing a man to marry a man, but we have. I think it's time we stop saying it can't happen here and recognize it is happening here and we need to return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have a spiritual awakening that shakes the roots of this country. Nations will be judged for scattering the Jewish people throughout history. Joel 3 and 2 says, I will also gather all nations. Again, 
all nations, and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. The valley of Jehoshaphat is in, is in Israel. It's Armageddon. And I will enter into judgment with them there. Listen, on account of my people, not the church, but on account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Remember in the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my first son. On account of my people, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, then God says they have divided up my land. End of quote. When you try to divide up Israel, you're trying to divide a covenant land that God gave the Jewish people, and you are de facto declaring war on God Almighty. God's message to America is there is no West Bank, there is only Judea and Samaria. So stop calling for Jerusalem to be divided so the Palestinians can have a couple, can, can have a capital. Jerusalem is the city of God. Jerusalem is the capital city of the Jewish people. Yesterday, today, and forever, it belongs to them. The President of the United States says repeatedly that East Jerusalem must be divided and given to the Palestinians as a capital. Well, Mr. President, to use your own words, that's above your pay grade. <laughs> Jerusalem was given to the Jewish people thousands of years ago. God made a covenant, and God does not break covenant. And if America does not honor that covenant, God will crush this nation. Nations will lose their land for seizing Jewish land. Jeremiah 12, 14, and 17, this is what the Lord says. As for all the wicked neighbors who seize the inheritance of Israel, that's their land, I will give to my people Israel the land and I will uproot them I will uproot those nations from their land. If any nation does not listen to me, I will completely uproot and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 12, 14 through 17. God says, you take their land, I'm going to take your land. You think that's why China is taking our land? It's something to think about. Nations will be plundered for plundering Israel. Zechariah 2, verses 8 and 9, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you, Israel, touches the apple of God's eye. The word apple translates pupil. God says when you pick on Israel, it's like sticking me in the, mint, in the middle of my eye, the pupil. Try sticking someone with your eye, finger in their eye and see how fast you get slapped. <laughs> I don't care how gentle they are. For surely, God says, I will shake my hand against them and they shall become spoiled for their servants. God will allow the battle of Armageddon because nations ignored Israel's right to the land that God has given them. Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. And they gathered them to the place called Armageddon. Armageddon means the Mount of Megiddo. That's what it means in Hebrew. The Mount of Megiddo is a large hill in Israel. I've been there about 38 times now. It's just west of the Jordan River in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Alexander the Great stood there and said, this is the most natural battlefield on the face of the earth. And he's right. The Euphrates River will dry up, allowing the marching army of the kings of the east of 200 million to approach from the east. The Bible says demon spirits are going to go out from Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet and gather those armies all over the world. And the kings of the east will invade Israel and the king of the west will be waiting for them with his massive armies that he's created from Europe and from America. Blood is going to flow, the Bible says, to the bridle of a horse for 1,600 furlongs, Revelation 14 and 20, 1,600 
100 furlongs is 200 miles. Blood to the bridle of a horse from here to Houston, Texas is a lot of blood. The hand of God will protect the Jewish people. They're going to flee to Petra where God will protect and defend them just as he protected and defended them when they were going from Egypt into the promised land. He will feed them. He will bring them water there. It will be a supernatural protection for for three and a half years, 42 months. The hand of God will protect them and the hand of God will crush every nation that goes after them. The Bible says, the Lord speaking, I'm coming as a thief in the night. People do not expect the thief. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm coming at an unexpected time. The rapture of the church is going to happen seven years before the battle of Armageddon. We clearly see these four kings on the face of the earth right now. The Bible says, blessed is he that watches. Why? Because if you're not watching for his coming... He's not coming for you. The Bible says to those that eagerly look for him will he appear the second time. The point, if you're not looking for him, he's not coming for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 28, watch and pray. Hear that? Say it with me. Watch and pray that you be counted worthy to escape those things coming on the earth. What is he talking about? He's talking about the great tribulation. Because it is literally hell on earth. Will there be a rapture if Jesus is coming back? Why now? Second Peter 3 and 2. Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers saying, where is the sign of his coming? The fact that you doubt he's coming back is proof positive he's coming back. I like that. The four blood moons, he's coming back. Israel being, re, Israel being reborn, he's coming back. Jerusalem being brought back to the Jewish people, he's coming back. The fact that you do not believe he's coming back is living proof he's on his way. If you listen closely, you can hear the footsteps of Messiah shuffling through the clouds of glory. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. Will there be a rapture? First Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself, hear that word? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. The voice is the shout of victory over death, hell, and the grave. The trump is the announcing of royalty, because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace and the King of all kings. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord forever in the clouds of heaven, and so shall we be with the Lord in the air. You say, well, that's never happened before. Oh, yes, it has. In the Old Testament, there was the prophet Elijah. He was caught up by chariots of fire and taken alive into heaven. He's been there for 3,500 years. I wonder what he's eating up there. I mean, that's, I know that's a thought that's really not in my notes, but I just wonder. He's coming back to earth. In the book of Revelation, he's one of the two witnesses. And he's coming back to the Jewish people to say, Messiah is coming. The last thing in the book of Malachi, Jesus, the the, the prophets tell the Jewish people, I'm sending Elijah back to you. Watch for him. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead, literally rose from the dead and ascended to his father in heaven. And he is standing in the heavens right now, prepared to receive the church triumphant. We're getting ready to leave this world, ladies and gentlemen. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. When Jesus left, Acts 111, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, say that with me, this same Jesus shall come in like manner, meaning literally, meaning physically, meaning visibly, 
As you have seen him go, so shall he come again. That's in the Bible. Put these verses together and you have this picture. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Glory, appears in the clouds of heaven as lightning flashes from the east to the west. The trump of God shall sound, announcing the appearance of royalty, for he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The voice of the archangel shall summons the righteous from their graves all over the earth. Graves are going to explode. Mausoleums will topple. Cars are going to be vacated by their drivers that were driving down the road. Planes being driven by the rights being flown by the righteous will be vacated as the pilots sail to meet the Lord in the air all over the earth. The graves are going to surrender to the triumphant shout of King Jesus over death, hell, and the grave. Saints of God, the kings of the earth are on center stage for the battle of the thrones. The Bible says when you see these things, lift up your heads and rejoice because the king of all kings is coming and his name is Jesus. Let me show you this chart and I'll talk you through the end of it. The next thing to appear that's going to happen. Here we are right now living in San Antonio, Texas. X marks the spot. John in Revelation 4 hears the voice saying, come up here. And he goes into the heavens and he sees what God is going to do on the earth. So the church leaves the earth in Revelation 4. When we get to heaven, we're going to experience the judgment seat of Christ. Every believer is going to be judged, not whether you're saved or lost, but what you did on this earth for the Lord, the gap that exists between what you could have done and what you did do when you served the Lord on earth. We leave the world as soon as we're gone, there's going to be an economic collapse because we're the only one working and paying taxes. Yeah. So the Antichrist, who's going to come out of Europe, is going to put together an economic system that will stabilize the world. I believe it will be a cashless society. He's going to force every person on the earth to receive his mark in their right hand and their forehead and it can happen very suddenly with all the people who are involved in the military or have a government job of any kind. You cannot buy nor sell without that mark. But if you take that mark, John the Revelator said, you will lose your soul. If you don't take that mark, the Antichrist will cut your head off much like ISIS is doing right now. So we are into heaven. The economic crisis happens. The Antichrist comes out. He establishes a new global economic system. And then he establishes 10 nation kingdoms. I showed you that map last week. He will rule three of them. And he will have seven who will follow him. Hence, he is the beast out of the book of Revelation with three horns, with three crowns, and the beast of seven heads and ten crowns. That's very, very clear. Then, the first thing he does officially is to make a seven-year treaty with Israel. I've told you in the sermons previously the contents of that treaty. He's going to allow the Jewish people to build the third temple. I think that he will promise the Palestinians Eastern Jerusalem. And I think he will make some deal with the Catholic Church to get their approval to make all of this happen. That's just my summation about what he's going to do. But I think that's what has to be done. Then, once he makes that treaty, he is going to 
bring about absolute control of the world. Economically, you cannot buy a loaf of bread or a half a gallon of milk without his approval or his mark. The world continues. The six seals of the revelation, which is the sun begins to scorch the earth. Hello, Al Gore. Global warming is going to happen, baby, right here. Get on your bathing suit and get out there. <laughs> the rivers, the streams, the oceans are going to turn to blood. This is in the book of Revelation. Vegetation will be burned up. There's going to be a global food shortage like the world has never known. And now we approach and come to the three and a half year mark right here. Listen closely. These first 42 months are called the tribulation. The last half is called the great tribulation because the suffering here is far greater than right here. But now the suffering is getting ready to turn up. The king of the west, the, ant, the king of the north, and the king of the south, Russia and the Islamic horde invade Israel right here. And as soon as that massive army comes marching down to Israel, God Almighty looks from his holy throne and he lasts them to derision. He looks at that covenant land that he gave to his chosen people. I, the book of Ezekiel says, and my fury will come up in my face. God says, I'm going to do these three things. He will send an earthquake like the world has never known where every wall shall fall down according to the prophets and the mountains shall fall down. He's going to open the earth and swallow thousands of that invading army and bury them alive. There will be so much dirt, dust and hysteria. They will turn on each other. More will die. And lastly, God is going to send hailstones from heaven to absolutely crush and pulverize them. If a million are sent, the number is irrelevant. Russia will be history. Islam will be history. Only one in six are going to survive. King James, Ezekiel 38, 1 and 2, I will leave but a sixth part of thee. Now that the king of the north and the king of the south are out of the picture, the king of the west, the Antichrist, moves into Israel. He sets his throne up in the city of Jerusalem. He sets his image up in the city of Jerusalem. He sets his military headquarters up between the seas, according to the Bible. He rules the world for 42 months when he puts his image up to be worshiped. It will be the fulfillment of Antiochus Epiphanes, Matthew 24, 15. At this point in time, some righteous Jew is going to figure out who he is by the geometry of his last name and shoot him in the head. He's going to survive miraculously, emulating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's going to rise up, and he will have the Hitler disposition toward the Jews. He is going to try to annihilate them. The Jewish people will be moving toward Petra. Remember, this is what Jesus said. When you see this happening... Run to the mountains and get there. As the Antichrist begins to move this massive military armada toward Petra to get the Jewish people, his intelligence comes to him and says, there are 200 million Chinese coming up the Euphrates River and they're going to head us off. Then comes the battle of Armageddon. These two massive armies meet and they collide and the blood flows to the bridle of a horse. The horror of it is beyond the ability of the human tongue to describe or for the mind to grasp. And as they are fighting 